The year was 1880, and Molly had been terribly sick for some time. On a cold October morning, with her small family gathered around her, Molly bravely faced death and what lay beyond. Her family and friends were thrown into deep mourning after the death and set about preparing the house and Molly for the funeral. First, they stopped the clock in Molly's room, both to record the time of death and as a superstition to avoid bad luck. Then they covered the mirrors. The family didn't want to take the chance that Molly's spirit could get caught in the glass, and they didn't want her remaining family being tempted by vanity. A black wreath would be hung on the front door to signal to all that a death had occurred in the house. Visitors would know to knock gently instead of ringing the bell. Thus, mourning began for Molly's family. In the late 19th century, death and mourning was an intensely personal affair, but it was also bound to the burdens of etiquette. So much etiquette. The Victorian era still saw the home as the focal point for death and grief. Most people still died in and were attended to in the home, but the outside world was exerting its influence. Families, especially women, had to worry about how their personal death and mourning would be viewed by society. They may even have to worry about how a death would be covered in the local newspapers, because achieving a good death, meaning meeting eternity with eyes open, bravely facing God in judgment, thought-provoking last words of wisdom poised on their lips, was the hope and goal of every person. The pressure to achieve the good Christian Victorian death was intense. But with so many variables, the good death was just not available to everyone. What makes the Victorian way of death so fascinating is that it's recognizably modern. The casket, the embalming, the proper death, the proper grief. But they also had an intimacy and comfort with the idea of death and the physical dead body that we haven't seen in a hundred years. Before we return to Molly, I should say we are filming today at the Merchant's House Museum in New York City, which is basically a Victorian death time capsule. How did we get permission to shoot here? I'm totally unclear, it's all a blur, but we're not gonna ask too many questions. La 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 la, this is awesome. Because we're at the merchant's house, we're focusing on a very specific kind of Victorian death, middle class to upper middle class people who lived in New York during this time period, which excludes important parallel histories, but allows us to focus in on the life and death of one family. So to Molly. Upon Molly's death, her sisters or mother would immediately have sent word out to the local shop or dressmaker, telling them they needed proper full mourning clothes. Mourning attire became such big business in the late 19th century that department stores like Lord and Taylor had mourning clothes departments. Women were employed to put together whole mourning wardrobes for people and then send them over to the home immediately. Made of black crepe, these clothes weighed heavy on the family, figuratively and literally. High quality crepe was made of silk, wool, or a combination of the two, and the fabric was treated with chemicals to make it completely matte, stiff, and crinkly, like, quote, the folds of a brain. Black crepe mourning clothes were expensive, uncomfortable, smelled like a charnel house, and were saturated with arsenic. Crepe veils were known to cause blotches and crooked stains on the face, acne, and headaches. Widows were scrutinized for the depth of their grief. Woe be to the widow who didn't commit to the costume and behaviors of mourning. Soon after Molly's death, the undertaker would have been called. Now, in the earlier part of the 19th century, undertakers were the getters. They were the guy you'd call to get you the casket, the black draping, the mourning accoutrement, the transportation for the corpse. But by the later 19th century, the undertaker, at the time transitioning to the more professional title of funeral director, was convincing the public that their skills were more of a necessity. 
This was their profession. Embalming figured heavily into the professionalization of The Undertaker. Sure, the average woman could wash a corpse, but they couldn't embalm one. When Seabury Treadwell, merchant of the merchant's house, died in 1865, he was not embalmed, and the family probably did not even seriously consider it. But by the time our Molly died in 1880, undertakers were regularly pushing embalming, and the public was buying it. When Molly died, embalming was still largely done in the privacy of the home. The undertaker or embalmer would bring a kit with him and set to work, usually in the bedroom or kitchen. Most undertakers had their secret way of embalming a body, and not all techniques were created equal. But let's just say there was usually a lot of arsenic involved. That's right, more arsenic. <laughs> Before The Undertaker arrived, a female nurse, servant, a relative, or even a trusted neighbor might attend to the corpse. In Molly's case, we'll say it's her dear friend and neighbor, uh, Miss Kate Lynn. Immediately after death, the eyes would be closed, using wet cotton wool placed on the eyelids, and a handkerchief would be tied under the jaw and around the head to keep the mouth closed until rigor mortis froze it in place. If preparing the body at home, my funeral home still advises our families to do this today, to avoid the gaping mouth look. The limbs would be straightened out, all while taking care to expose the body as little as possible. The body would then be washed with soap and water under a blanket or sheet, again to protect the dead person's dignity, and afterward all linens would be disposed of, preferably by burning. The body's orifices would be packed with cotton or rags. From there, a nightgown or clean clothes would be put on the body, the hair brushed and styled, and the arms set in place. After a few hours, the eye pads and handkerchief would be removed, leaving the face set in a sleep-like repose. Burial clothes, just like regular clothes, could be made to order or purchased ready-made. Some women even sewed their own burial clothes or shrouds and lovingly kept them in tissue paper under the bed, like a wedding garment. Once the corpse was cleaned, and if the family wanted embalmed, they would be moved to the parlor for viewing and eventually their funeral. Corpses would typically stay in the home for several days to allow for far off relatives to arrive and allow the family some time with the body. If needed, the body could be cooled with ice to slow decay. There were even ice coffins or patented corpse coolers to keep the body cool and perhaps less smelly in the warmer months. Elaborate and abundant flower arrangements not only decorated the casket, but helped mask any unpleasant odors. The funeral was typically held in the home, with family and friends assembling in the parlor. After the service, the casket would be carried out the door feet first. This was to make sure the dead would not look back into the house and decide to stay, or beckon others to follow them to the grave. The funeral party would then follow the hearse in a procession to the cemetery. Sometimes the procession would take a roundabout route to the cemetery, so the ghost of the dead wouldn't find their way back home. After the funeral, mourners would go back to the house for food and drink, similar to what we typically do now. Mourning cards would be sent out following the funeral. These were small, black-bordered cards with information like the deceased's birth and death date, perhaps a poem or prayer, and sometimes a photograph. Occasionally, for close family, a bonus lock of hair would be included. Ta -da. It was expected that people would keep the mourning cards as a keepsake in an album. Gotta catch them all! Ah, uh, but we're not done yet. Join us for our next video when we take a closer look at the most striking element of Victorian death culture, mourning photography. Thank you so much to the Merchant's House Museum for letting us take over for the day. Sadly, this wonderful place is in danger from developers. Your support as visitors, as well as donations to the Merchant's House Legal Fund, linked below, can help save this landmark. They've already spent hundreds of thousands of dollars in legal fees. We donated to the Merchant's House Legal Fund, and if you're able to, we hope you will as well. 
This video was made with generous donations from death enthusiasts just like you. I feel like I should be handing out brochures. I Something about God, Jesus, and all of the apostles. Take this woman. She was very sick, and now she is finally dead. That's a shame because her boots were so incredible, and everybody loved her. Yes, this is your dear friend Molly. What's my motivation? Yeah, that's the question I have, yes. This is what I say to you. I'm reading you from this book. This is, I believe, all in Latin. I forget how bright it is. I can make it in Manhattan, New York City. I can make it anywhere.